Well, I was afraid that was going to happen. I'd have to follow Willie. And uh... Now, uh, the first thing I want to say about, you know, it's funny, we got Anthony and Willie here. They're talking about thermometers. I, I, my dad went to A&M, and as a matter of fact, one of his classmates is here today. But um, my dad's first job was in OBS and Method, Research Meteorology at Atlantic City's uh, FAA Tech Center, right? And so in July of 1969, Atlantic City recorded uh, on the 19th or 20th, recorded the highest temperature in the country at 106, which was very interesting since no one within 150 miles of Atlantic City was over 100 that day. And the wind's roaring in out of the south that, you know, even at the airport 14 miles inland, the sea breeze gets in. Well, what happened was dad comes home because there's no way it was 106 today. I mean, you know, we're sitting there in the low 80s in Summers Point. So you know what he did? He went out there with five thermometers. And he found out that the Atlantic City thermometer, while it was fine at 32 degrees, because they used to put the thermometers in ice baths and see, or measure them at 32, the, the error of the thermometer was increasing as it got warmer. So it was 94 degrees reading 106, and that, that record still stands today. They won't change the darn record. And I was in instrumentation at Penn State, and uh, I have permanent scars from that class. I'll tell you that right now. So, all this stuff is all gets kind of spooky. Now, this the, the, the title of this is, I don't have the answers, but I got some questions. It's sort of like, you know, the Festivus thing where Frank Costanza comes out, I got some problems with you people, and now you're going to hear about it. Not with you people, but other, other situations here. So let's, oh, I got to move the slide here along. I don't know how to go forward. There we are. Uh, you know, it's kind of funny in science, uh, there pro there's, two, there's two biblical references to me, that describes signs. Proverbs 25, 2 is glory of God to seal, uh, conceal a matter, search the matter out, glory of kings. And then Paul, the apostle Paul said, those who know what they know don't yet know what they ought to know. All right? And so what happens is the more you discover, the more you discover, the more you go, holy smokes, I don't really know much. <laughs> and and it, it, it has to do with the infinite majesty of the, of the universe. So this was a very interesting uh, situation. Um, uh, this lady, uh, the, Rebecca Carey, she was a, a, a volcanologist at the University of Tasmania. In 2012, she said 75% of uh, volcanoes occur underwater. We know nothing about it. Now, that got me thinking because my, one of my professors at Penn State, Dr. John Kerr, said, we don't know anything about the oceans. We know virtually nothing. We're not even looking at them, really. All we're looking at is what we see in front of us rather than what might be concealed. So we're in a climate optimum, not an emergency. Quite frankly, it's amazing. It's great to get together at these conferences, but <laughs> the left is, a, oh, these people have actually pushed something that is nonsense and made it, uh, they've taken over the, the entire idea of the thing. And this is no big deal. What's going on? The warming. I wish it was a big deal because then it would really make me more important, but it's really not. And we have four times the amount of people on the planet in 1930 and 128 the amount of climate deaths. So what I want to know is if we are in a climate optimum and obviously life is getting better on Earth, how is this such an emergency? Well, life's never been better on planet Earth, so that's all I've got to say, and thanks for coming. I'm only kidding. When your name ends in a vowel, you don't throw in the towel. First of all, <laughs> got Murano. Is Murano in here? Um, temperatures, uh, th and this is from the Book of Care, John, uh, Penn State. Temperatures are poor climate metric. Wet bulbs are better. The best are saturation mixing ratios. They refuse to quantify that. Because, and I'm going to explain in just a moment. I'll keep moving on. The coral, this is correlation of saturation mixing ratio to temperatures. What it says is this, that the increase in one-tenth of a gram per kilogram of water vapor in the air correlates to a 10-degree rise in temperatures where it's very, very, very cold, minus 40 to minus 30. You need 90 times the amount of water vapor to do that where it's 75, 80 degrees. So if there's excess water vapor in the air, where do you think the warming is going to show up? So it shows up in the Arctic, right? 
And I, 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 become, I befriended uh, Dr. Uh, Arthur Vitorito, and what happened was, uh, look, here's, what, here's the problem I have. In what I do for a living, what is going on in the ocean is very, very important to feedback in the atmosphere. All right, and uh, you know, the Madden Julian oscillation, for instance, you can watch it oscillate based on the sea surface temperatures and the convergence patterns that go on. It releases all sorts of heat into the atmosphere, bang, it sets ridges up in certain places, troughs up in certain places. So we have to know what's going on. So I'm looking at the sea surface temperatures, and from the 80s to now, they're just warming up. And I'm saying, well, what the heck is causing this? Uh, we all agree it's not CO2, right? Not CO2. It, the sun, I'm, I'm going to show you a graphic from Dr. Soon. The sun, you could see the water vapor increase moving with the TSI, okay? But you also see something that's happened since the 80s, that there's been an increase in seismic activity, and no one wants to look at this, all right? If you get a big earthquake that goes off or a big volcano, so, oh, look at this, but most of the activity is going on underwater. So uh, I'm going to go through this real quick. Uh, there's a diagram of thermohaline circulation. I hate to tell Michael Mann, but guess what? It's not CO2 that's causing all the warming in the North Atlantic. Uh, he won't look. Pretty good argument for correlation and causation in this particular case. This is the increase in seismic activity and the temperature going up. And that puts water vapor in the air so the, 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 um, the warming is distorted. It's more in the Arctic than it is anywhere else. Now, it's interesting. Greg, uh, uh, Greg yesterday pointed out what's going on in Antarctica, that the, that the melting of the uh, Antarctic ice cap is below. And see, I said, well, bingo. Well, when I look at these temperatures off New Zealand, the sea surface temperatures off New Zealand, and what's going on in the North Pacific, I'm like, well, what the heck? Why aren't we, why aren't we uh, trying to observe what's going on there instead of just we, we could see it in Antarctica because we got, so, we got uh, more saturation of um, data down there. And yeah, I don't know if it's a coincidence, is it? There's the increase in seismic activity and it, it correlates nicely with the increase in sea surface temperatures. Again, if you increase the temperature of the ocean, you put more water vapor in the air. We know the relationship of water vapor to temperature. You know how you, 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 know how you can figure out what CO2 is done? If you could, and, and this, is what, this is what drives me crazy about my field. All you need to do is try your very, very, very best to approximate the water vapor transport into the air from, let's say, the sea surface temperatures in 1983 versus now. All right, because there's no one, when you look at these temperatures, if you had the sea surface temperatures you had in the 70s and 80s, no way is it warming up the way it is. And so whatever minute warming there is, that's your, that may be your man-made man uh, warming or whatever they want to call it today. Now look at this, at, all right, this is the oceans in 1988 and the, under, the, the first big increase of seismic activity began in 85. But look at how cold the sea surface temperatures are in 1988. And look at the oceans now. You're not even looking at the same thing. As far as the, as far as the transport of energy from the oceans into the atmosphere, this is, this, is, this is remarkable. And by the way, apparently there's a CO2 ferry that I don't know about in the Southern Hemisphere and in the Northern Hemisphere that says, I bequeath a hot spot here and a hot spot there and a hot spot there. Look at those, look at the hot spots in there. Where the heck are they coming from? So the oceans are actually, they're warming up. And what happens is you see the atmosphere, you, La Chatier's principle, you see the atmosphere fight back, try to even it out. But every time it cools, it leaves the base temperature of the ocean a little bit warmer. So we gotta figure out what the heck is going on here, all right? Again, again, I don't have the answers, but if you tell me it's not CO2, right? We all agree on that. If you, if you eliminate some of these other things, there must be something causing this to happen. So these hot spots are very important in the forecast. Now watch this. This is from Joe DeLeo at weatherbell.com, all right? He points out the hot spot in the North Pacific and it argues for Western and Central cold in February and March. So he said, well, it's been awfully warm in February. Oh, wait till March is done, right? It's like the revenge of winter is coming for much of the United States, including people in the Northeast. 
It's almost like the hurricane season, remember? At the end of August, oh, nothing's going on, blah, 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 blah. And look what happens, right? You can see the atmosphere setting things up. So each of these areas, what Joe does is, he looks at certain sea surface temperatures in certain areas, and he correlates the temperatures over the United States, right? The problem is that when we, when we talk about this, when we make our seasonal forecast, I go, well, Joe, I don't think you could use 1978 with today because it's a completely different feed. Now, I'm not going to say completely different, but the feedback is a bit different today. So February, March come out like this. So you say, oh, wait a minute. It's been warm in the central part of the United States. Like I said before, you know, we've got a, uh, we've got a tremendous uh, stratospheric warming event going on now, right? And the last two times that happened, beautifully correlated, 84 and 2018, the blend of those two will come out to that. So if the oceans had not warmed, the air would not have warmed significantly. The oceans and more water vapor in the atmosphere, so warming is more in colder, drier areas in the winter season. It distorts the warming, changes the feedback. Now, Willie soon got me thinking, because he's, he and the Connollys uh, have, have uh, taken a lot of balloon measurements and the, the Hadley cell is collapsing, which would make sense if you have distorted warming. Why? Because if there's more upward motion further north, what's that going to do to the Hadley cell? This is big in meteorology. It's also, by the way, not a sign that the planet's going to blow up. It's a sign that the natural fight back of the atmosphere to the warming that is occurring, is occurring, that nature's, nature's fighting back. It has major implications, all right? More water, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to go through this real quick. It influences everything. Hurricanes are developing further north, but they are smaller in size. We've got to get rid of the Saffir-Simpson scale. I've been proposing a power and impact scale that measures the radius also of gale force winds, uh, 34, 50, and 64 knot winds. Not this, oh, well, right near the center, Right near the center, you've got 125 mile an hour winds as a category four, right? I'm like, well, wait a minute. Harvey, Harvey, which hit Texas, and of course it stalled and they had a lot of rain, but Harvey's radius of hurricane force winds was 150 miles. Carlos was 400 miles. How are they both category fours? If Donna went through Florida today, if Donna from 1960 went through Florida category four, you might have had a trillion dollars of damage. That's how powerful Donna was. And Donna didn't screw around. She was still a three in North Carolina, a two up in New England. That's, that's an unbelievable storm. So look at the Arctic. No warming in their warm season. Oh, isn't that interesting? It's only warming in the winter. Now, I wonder why that would happen. Well, part of the reason is that if you, the, the action of refreezing actually heats, warms the atmosphere, melting actually cools it. But the amount of water vapor increase is not yet great enough to affect the temperature around 32 degrees. News flash to people claiming that the Arctic ice cap is missing. The average temperature around the Arctic is 32, 33 in the summertime. So if it's not getting a much above freezing, guess what? That Arctic ice cap isn't disappearing. Now, you have to be ignorant, in my opinion, to spout what leftists do on climate migrants. How the heck is a generation or even two generation going to measure 0.1 C increase in temperatures in Central America, right? You see, you see this, there's virtually no increase here. However, if you are a uh, polar bear that wants to migrate south, you do notice it is warming up in the Arctic more. Uh, uh, another thing, John Kerry, remember Boko Haram? That's a major drought, and that's why we have a terrorist organization. Well, the reason why we've been having bigger hurricane seasons is because it's wet in Africa. Bill Gray used to talk about this, and it's been very, very wet in the areas where Boko, Boko Haram, uh, not a drought. They just, they just say stuff, and no one calls them on it. I'm just absolutely fascinated with this. The Pacific Ring of Fire, every time the La Nina shows up, you can see the sea surface temperatures remaining very, very warm. In fact, that area around New Zealand I wish they'd do some research on that because the, the sea surface temperatures are unbelievably warm there. Now watch this, 1951 through 1960, these are the sea surface temperature anomalies, skin surface temperatures, right? We go 1981 to 1990, not much change, would you agree? See any change? 
but the most recent 10 years, it is warm. Now, where, wh why does that just happen all of a sudden? And believe me, uh, when, you, when, you look at, when you look at the change in the anomalies over the North Pacific, this is a big, big deal for forecasters. Now, in the, uh, until the early 90s, the TSI was in lockstep with temperatures, right? But then the temperatures, uh, the, uh, the temperatures began to shoot up. So there's no change, the sea surface temperatures, no change for 40 years and then the jump. Here's TSI versus water vapor. I got this from doctors. How, you, you can't beat that correlation, can you? All right. I would say. Now, this is seismic activity, underwater ge uh, geothermal forcing versus temperatures. That's pretty darn good. Now, this is, a, this is a steal from Dr. Spencer here. My argument on this water vapor is that every time a super nino goes off, an amazing amount of water vapor goes up into the air. When it spreads out, where do you see the warming? It's in the, it's mo it's in the Arctic more, right? All right, so if we uh, continue on here, CO2 versus temperature, if we're playing the correlation game, it has the least amount. You see what I'm saying? So, so these other, so I'm, I'm sitting here going, well, why aren't you looking at the other things? Why is it the me my community, these young guys, I go, why do you just sit there and go along with it? Don't, don't, aren't you curious as to why it's happening? So uh, uh, TSI and seismic activity, stronger correlations in CO2, what's the cause? Let me move through this, okay? We can see the proof in the weather. See the where and when it's warmer. <laughs> Changes in sea level pressure and global wind oscillation, tropical cyclone ex um, changes. Let me go through this quick. Again, no warming in the Arctic during its summer season. That's a big key. All right. Sea now, look at this. You, got, you guys, I'm sorry I get so fired up about this. It's like, it's, it's, it, this is what God made me to do, so I go crazy over it. Look at the sea level pressures over Southeast Asia and across the United States and in the Arctic in the last 10 years. Now look at those surface pressures, 76 and 85. You had high pressure all over the place. Now do you understand what that means as far as the global wind oscillation? All right, if you have lower pressures over Asia, Southeast Asia is creating stronger easterlies through the tropical Pacific, which tends to lead to more subsidence, sinking air over the tropical Pacific, hence the reason why that Hadley cell observation may be what it is. Change in the global wind oscillation. Sinking air relative to the normal vertical velocities over the tropics. The drying over the tropics, counter to the trapping hotspot idea. Remember, listen, if you trap heat in the Arctic, it's not that big a deal, all right? If you trap heat over the tropics, you're in a heap of trouble, boy, because what's going to happen is that's going to start feeding back like crazy. That goes against nature also. The warmer it gets, the tougher it is to get it warmer. It's much easier to just cut the feet out from under this, and all of a sudden, the temperature drops a half degree C across the planet, and people are starving. Shifting the size of storms, shifting the hurricane paths, the weakening of the Hadley cell, more increased solar radiation over tropical waters, more outgoing long radiation, which CO2 does use. You know what? If the oceans are not warm, CO2 is not even a big deal. I don't think it's a big deal anyway, but. CO2 feeds on the warming of the Earth. It's not the CO2 warming the Earth, it's the Earth is getting warmer, so there's more outgoing long wave radiation showing up. And, yeah, and you know what Anthony showed? One minute. Oh, I haven't told my jokes yet. Uh, no, what, what Anthony showed, those nighttime pictures, right? I could tell you horror stories about the Penn State sighting uh, place with that stuff. Now look, real quick, West Pacific storms, 1959. Notice the, tra notice the track race east of the Philippines, right? This is 59. The, look at the most recent year. They're further north. They're developing later. Even the hyper season, this is 1933 uh, uh, versus uh, the 2020 season. All of them are developing in closer to the coast where, you know, the Irmas are becoming more and more rare. So the sa I, I, I talked about replacing the Saffir Simpson scale. Specific humidity, real quick, 1951 through 1960. This is 400 millibars. 
1976 to 85, boom, look what's going on. It's drying out. It's drying out and shifting west. There's no fingerprint as far as this tra trapping hotspot goes. There's 400, this is, this is, do you realize how opposite this is? What the, what, there's 400 millibar cooling over the tropics and the stratosphere is warming up over the tropics. What does that mean? If the stratosphere expands, what happens to the troposphere underneath? It's actually cooling a little bit. We're starting to see that. It's distorted. There's distortion of the warming in the north. That changes a bunch of things, and it's also the sign the atmosphere is fighting back. So I, I'm done. I, I went over this before. The Hadley, the Hadley cell is weakening, and there's a reason for you. You set me off over there. So, so it, it's not CO2. My questions are raised based on observations. Need to know. The hypothesis is formed based on a search for the unmoved mover behind this. So guess what? Let's say there is more seismic activity going on. We find it's heating up. Then we look, well, what the heck is causing that? Now, I, I happen to believe the sun and the, the, the pull of the sun and the, the moon. and the, that, That's where the, he's a, that the sun is the grand conductor of the entire orchestra. But in the meantime, I'm still trying to figure out who the, the lead soloist is right now. And it's important. And some of you meteorologists out here that are still forecasting, You've got to figure out where the heck this is coming from because it's, it, it's a big, big deal as far as the feedback's concerned. All right, enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you got.